to do is every time I read a verse, I'm going to have you stand for it. Amen. I mean, if we read them to start off with, we might need to just do it. Keep this bunch awake. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, look with me to the book of John in the 12th chapter. Go ahead and stand with me in respect to God's Word as we get the blood flowing up to the brain. Amen. John chapter number 12. And uh, just going to pick off where Brother Ed uh, left us there with this New Testament message on that same theme. John chapter 12, we're going to pick it up in verse number 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life for in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Yeah, amen. amen. I'm going to preach a message this afternoon entitled Life in This World. Life in This World. You know that we all have to live in this world, don't we? And there's a song that reminds us this world is not our home, but it's not. And really, we don't do a lot of preaching on it. But listen, things that you do, that you, that the, the way you live your life here on this earth is going to determine some special privileges that you have in the millennial reign of Christ. And uh, you're going to take some things, some dedications and things that you said no to and yes to, uh, you're going to take them into this next life there. And uh, so it's important that we just grasp these spiritual truths, really, that uh, are going to make a difference in, the, in this life and also the life to come. Amen? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we pray you'll bless the time together. <clears throat> Thank you for the good admonition from Brother Ed. And bless this, uh, this passage to our hearts and lives. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated, all right? Thank you so much for standing with me here, John chapter number 12. I want you to notice in John chapter 12, verse number 23 again, and Jesus answer it, answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son should be glorified. And you know, the Lord Jesus, he illustrates <clears throat> what, what he just said with an illustration from nature. Charles Spurgeon said, if a preacher will just study the natural sciences he will never lack for an illustration. Yeah. You know, there really, there are so many things in the natural world yeah. that we have that we can make a spiritual application to. Uh, for instance, planting. Men have been planting and growing crops the same way going all the way back to Adam. The basic idea of putting a seed into the ground. That has never changed. Now, the magnitude in how we do it has changed but the basic idea for something to grow, you got to put a seed in the ground. Amen. And then you have to cover it up with soil. And so you can help build your soil. And then with rain and sunshine, that seed is going to sprout roots down below and upward breaks through that soil. It's amazing to me how a tender, tender plant can work its way through the hard soil and grow. So he is illustrating really... <clears throat> What, what, uh, what's happening in the life of Christ in these verses. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And he'll be glorified in his person. He'll be glorified in his place. Jesus is going to be glorified in his ministry. He's going to be glorified in his death and burial and resurrection. Amen. And he's using the illustration of a corn of wheat die. I remember, uh, I think it was last year, a preacher friend of mine asked me to preach a, a preach at a cornhole tournament. Amen. It was all men that were there, and they probably had about uh, 60, 70 people that were participating in this cornhole tournament, and he asked me to preach at it. And I said, Lord, what in the world am I going to preach to these men? Really, they're just going to be, they're just going to be listening to me while they're waiting to play cornhole. And uh, what can I do? So I started meditating on it and thinking about it. And the Lord gave me a message entitled, The Gospel According to Cornhole. 
Man, when I introduced that title, you told about some heads popping up like, what in the world is this preacher about to say? <clears throat> but there's so many things about nature that are just absolutely fascinating. How many of you have ever planted beans before, huh? Beans, if I'm not mistaken, beans grow from left to right. That's the way they grow around the pole from left to right. If you was to unwind it and wound it up from right to left, it's going to die in three days. The way everything is harvested, seeds always produce in numbers of two, in, in even numbers. When seeds are, whether it's a flower <clears throat> or whether it's a fruit or whatever it is, they always produce in even numbers. Amen. And I've talked about the gospel according to cornhole. Amen. You explain the basic game of cornhole. But a lot of times in those bags, they don't have corn anymore. they got beans. But anyway, the devil always tries to ruin everything, doesn't he? Amen. <laughs> but that corn, that kernel has to go into the ground and die. And when it dies, then it can spring forth Amen. and a plant can grow. It's once been said, you can, pl you can count the, the seeds in an apple, but you cannot count the apples in a seed. And because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, and rose from the grave, many, many hundreds and thousands of people will live for all eternity because somebody, symbolized the corn of wheat, went into the ground and died and came alive again, and we have a chance to be saved. Amen. 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 So he's giving that illustration in this passage here, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. His glorious resurrection brings forth blessed results, Redemption for sinners, eternal salvation. Amen? Look at verse 25. Jesus is teaching believers something about life and life in this world. And he's teaching us something about after salvation, you know, after salvation with four powerful words. And here are the, the four words that we want to kind of concentrate on this afternoon. The word love and law, lose. The word love and lose. And then the word hate. And keep, look at verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And he says in verse 26, If a man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will I fa my father honor. So the words hate and love spoken by God in relation to, to people have been a source of confusion but, uh, and rejection and skepticism to a lot of people. But it shouldn't be that way. Amen? It shouldn't be that way for us. So we're going to take a look at verse number 26 in reverse and try to make it help us, allow it to help us. The Father's honor is to those that serve. Amen? That's pretty simple to understand. The Father's honor is to those that serve. And those that serve, they serve because they follow. So there's an unpopular requirement to those who truly follow the Lord. Uh, and we're going to go back to verse number 25 to see what it says. He says this. Here it is again. He that loveth his life shall lose it. So you're either going to love your life and you're going to lose it or... You're going to hate your life in this world, uh, and then you're going to keep it unto life eternal. So the Lord Jesus Christ, really, he teaches us, if you love your life, you're going to lose your life. Amen. Now, I have said it, and I understand in the context that I've said it, I've heard other people say it, but I love my life. I love the life that God allows me Amen. to live on this Amen. earth here. I love what I get to do. Amen. Amen. But I believe the reason why I'm lo I love my life is because I know that my life is counting for God's sake. Amen. Now, because I was called to preach and I gave the Lord uh, my, surrendered my life to the Lord, felt the call to evangelism right after I got saved, started traveling with Dr. Boyd, went off to Bible college. Oh, I can remember some times when I, you know, when I wanted to exert my own will. And uh, remember, good night, it was the first date that I'd had with Kim. And it was, I was a, uh, probably a freshman at Howells Anderson. 
maybe a sophomore. And uh, because I traveled with Dr. Boyd, my mentor, we traveled in the summertime, that when you're going to Bible college, it's important that you get a good job, work during the summertime, save up your money because it makes it easier to uh, start school on that semester. But because I was training in evangelism, I would travel all summer with Brother Boyd. And as a matter of fact, the summer that I got married, that Kim and I were married, I worked for Brother Boyd as a dean of men, and Brother Boyd paid me $50 a week. Now, how much money do you think I had saved up to marry a wife working $50 a week? Not a whole lot, amen? And uh, that's why she didn't marry for my money. She married me for my looks, amen? And I drove a 1967 Ford Ranger that was decked out with some nice tires and wheels, amen. And, uh, but I had to sell that because I needed to sell it and get married, amen. <laughs> but, uh, but I remember, listen, I just had, and, and that one, one evening there at, at a Joe Boyd banquet, we used to have those at Howes Anderson where we would recruit preacher boys to travel in the summertime. And I remember earlier that day, I told Brother Boyd, Brother Boyd, I'm working, I'm in school now. And I can't be asking my mom and dad, my dad, for any money to help me. I still have four siblings at home, and I just can't ask them for help. I'm going to have to just, I can't travel anymore. I got to work in the summertime because I got to pay my way through school. So it took a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, intest- for, intestinal fortitude to tell Brother Boyd that I'm not going to travel with you because he was just a big, tall, towering man and, Man, he just had that piercing look, just put you under convictions, uh, conviction when you, when you saw him. And there I was as a little old puny, you know, squeaky voice, preacher boy saying, Brother Boyd, I, I can't travel with you anymore. He didn't say much, but he said something while he was preaching. And uh, so there we were, probably about 400 people in that banquet area. And Dr. Boyd uh, said, uh, you know, he's talking about traveling with me. And he said, now, Oliver's not going to travel. And then he quoted a verse. He said, and Oliver has forsaken me for this present paycheck. <laughs> and he was alluding to that verse that, uh, you know, that Paul said about Demas. Demas hath forsaken me for this present world. But he said, and Oliver has forsaken me for this present paycheck. He said that out loud in his sermon. Everybody laughed like y'all did. And I don't remember if Kim laughed. But I didn't laugh. Man, it put me under conviction. And boy, I remember Brother Boyd preached, and what I did was I would taken my life back into my own hands. I'd given my life to the Lord. I said, I'm an evangelist. I'm going to travel. I'm going to learn this. I want to make a difference. And I'd taken my life back. I was trying to change, uh, do the easy route. I mean, listen, nobody wanted to hire me because every time I had to say, I'm going to work for you during this school year, and then I'm done. I'm quitting because I'm going, I'm, I'm traveling in the summertime. And uh, it was just like that. I'm going to work for you, but when the end of school comes, I'm done. I'm going to travel. And uh, boy, it got tough. But I told Brother Boyd that. And man, I remember after, he, after people laughed, he said that. Everybody laughed. And, but while he was preaching, I felt under such deep conviction. And I just said, dear God, what in the world have I done? I know what you've called me to do. I know what you want me to be. And here I am, I've taken my life back. And I said, I am so sorry. When Brother Boyd gave the invitation, I was the first one down the aisle. And Kim came right behind me, was praying for me to do the will of God. Now, I believe with all of my heart, listen to me now. I believe with all of my heart that I am here today. And I have what I have, have the privilege to do today. Because of that night. You see, if you love your life, you're gonna in this world you're gonna lose it. That's right. That's right. But if you hate your life, then you're gonna gain it. You're gonna love it. And that's the that is the principle that Jesus is laying out before us. That is his teaching. The Lord Jesus taught if you lo- love your life, you're gonna lose your life. But if you hate your life in this world, you're going to keep it unto life. Eternal. Isn't that amazing? Every single one of us have that opportunity. Amen. Now, is this teaching directed to preach to deacons? Or is it, a, or is it general teaching? When Jesus spoke these words about loving your life and losing your life, 
and hating your life and keeping it unto life eternal? Is he, is he directing that to preachers? Was that just given to the, the, the apostles, to, the, you know, to the, the leaders there? Well, if you look at that passage there, beginning with verse number 16, I'm not going to read it to you, but it, here's, what, here's, here's the audience that we find that Jesus was speaking those words to. He was talking to disciples. He was talking to the people that were with Lazarus. He was talking to people who had heard about his miracles they had gathered. Uh, he was talking to Pharisees and Greeks. He was talking to Philip of Bethsaida of Galilee and Andrew. So he wasn't just talking to the disciples the, that, uh, or the apostles. Jesus was giving that in, those instructions to a general audience just like you hear. This is not just for preachers. Jesus didn't say, hey, preachers, if you love your life, you're going to lose your life. Hey, preacher, if you're going to hate your life, in this world you're going to keep it unto life eternal. He didn't say that. That, get, that was given to a general audience. So if you want this teaching directed to preachers and deacons and missionaries, then you have to ask yourself why. Maybe you are trying to hold on to your life. Amen. Let the words of Christ, uh, listen, let them challenge you. Amen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This verse is not just a beautiful picture of the gospel, but it's also a picture of a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ dying to self. Amen. And that's what we don't want to do. We want to live for self. We don't want to die for self. If you go to Luke 14, verse 26, the words are in red. They're words of Christ, and it says this. If any man come to me and hate his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. I know people don't like to hear these words, but Jesus is saying, I deserve supreme love. He says, you're going to have to either love your life and lose it, or you're going to hate your life in this world and keep it unto life eternal. That's what he's saying. If you apply the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ about loving and hating and losing and keeping, what does that mean to you and how can you apply it? Well, he says, unto life in this world, keep it unto life eternal. You, you, you hate your life within the context of biblical understanding when you keep your life. Hate means to, it means to detest. It means to love less. Here's another verse. Think about it. Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Listen to these verses here. Uh, Brother Ed mentioned these already, but 1 John 2, 15, love not the world. Listen, we, we, we cannot be in love with this world. This world is passing off the scene. We want you to grab a hold of the things that are eternal. There's something better on the other side, and that's what we want for you. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Listen to this verse here from James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, he is not talking about men that committed adultery with a woman or vice versa. He is, he is, this is a spiritual application. Yes. Ye adulterers, adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Man, that is some strong, strong language there. But once again, you see you love your life and you're going to lose it, or you hate your life in this world and keep it unto life eternal. The Lord Jesus is teaching us, number one, the Lord Jesus is teaching us that if I love my life to the point, I give it everything at once with no regard for God, then I lose. Let me give that statement to you again. I wrote this down. The Lord Jesus teaches us that if, we, that if I love my life to the point, if I love my life to the point that I give it everything at once with no regard for God, 
no regard for God, then I'm going to lose. You see, you got to think, you got to think, learn to think in spiritual terms. Amen. That's why, you know, I remember when, when my mom and dad had gotten saved before we, the kids had gotten saved, but my dad got right with the Lord. Now, my dad was a, was a contractor. He worked two jobs just about the whole time I can remember. He drove a truck for Red Ball Motor Freight. He, did, he wasn't an over-the-road trucker, but he was what you call a hostler where he backed up trailers all day long at a dock. He used to say, I drive more backwards than most people drive forwards. And he backed up trailers and then he, in the evening, and then he did contracting work in the day. <clears throat> and then he, so he taught us, me and my two brothers, how to work, contracting work. And he loved the outdoors. He was a fisherman and he was a hunter and he loved those kind of things. And he gave us, my, me and my two brothers, he gave us a love for the outdoors. And I remember some of the most precious time running trot lines with my dad and my uncles, my cousins and my brothers. And man, laying them, we had, there was a creek called uh, Cedar Creek yeah. and there was a, a, a little channel that ran through there and we'd run those trot lines and man, it was just wonderful. We'd catch all kinds of fish, clean them up and have a, uh, have a fish fry. Just was my, When my dad got committed, he didn't stop fishing but he just stopped fishing on Sunday. He didn't stop hunting. He just stopped hunting on Sunday. So you see, if, if the Lord Jesus is teaching us, if, my, if I love my life to the point that I give it everything at once with no regard for God, then I'm going to lose. I give, I, I give earthly ease over heavenly hardships. There's some things about the Christian life, it's just hard. There are just things that we just do that are just hard. It's hard because it's spiritual work. I'm telling you, the most, the hardest work you will ever do in the Christian life is the work of prayer. Because prayer, there is no flesh in it at all. As a matter of fact, you have to sacrifice flesh to pray. Because you can work, you can always do something. So I give earthly ease, I give in to earthly ease over heavenly hardships. I give in to earthly pleasure over heavenly posture. I give in to earthly comfort over heavenly contentment. So the first thing is the Lord Jesus teaches us that if I, if I love my life to the point that I give my life everything at once with no regard for God, then I'm the big loser. But he says in return, the Lord Jesus teaches us that if I hate my life to the point that I deny everything my flesh craves or maybe not even everything but most things with no regard for me, then I win. I know this sounds kind of ridiculous, but, uh, but listen, it's what the Bible says and Paul is a good example to look to. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. We must count some worldly gains as loss if we are going to serve Christ. Amen. But the truth is, do we really lose anything when we give it to Jesus? Do we really lose anything? We don't lose anything. Amen. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Listen to this beautiful verse, Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Isn't it wonderful? And then here's number three. Think about this. Number one, remember? Remember what it was? The Lord Jesus teaches that if I love my life to the point, I give it everything at once with no regard for God, I lose. Point number two, the Lord Jesus teaches us that if I hate my life to the point I deny everything that the flesh craves with no regard for me, I win. Well, here's the third number point. Who knows more about life than the Lord Jesus? 
Amen. Who knows more about my happiness, my fulfillment, my satisfaction? Who knows more about that than the Lord Jesus? He knows about it. Amen. He made us. He knows us. And what does he say about my life lived on this earth? He says, if I find it, I lose it. He says, if I lose it for his sake, I find it. So the choice has got to be mine to make. Amen. So where do I start with something like this? <clears throat> well, number one, you start by getting saved. Amen. And I trust everybody has a day and time where you've been born again. And then you follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Amen. And then you, you're a member of a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. I cannot stress how important it is. Oh, listen, to being part of a right kind of church. And, and then have you offered yourself to God in consecration? The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You see, the thing about a living sacrifice is it's alive. So it can crawl on the altar, but it can also crawl off the altar. Present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Amen. Oh, listen, Amen. all those things, those things that uh, we naturally know to do. So here's the question. Are you consciously and purposefully engage, amen, in seeking those things that are above. Amen, the life of Christ, the life of Christ. If I, if I give everything my flesh craves, then I'm going to lose. But if I deny what my flesh wants, I'm going to win. And nobody knows anything, anything more about life on this earth than the creator of life the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And I tell you, friend, you know what? I, I, and I'm, I, I could be wrong, but I have never, ever met anybody that told me that they regretted getting, getting saved. If somebody said that, I doubt that they even really knew Christ. That's Amen. Right. I doubt that they even knew Him right. as their Savior. But I've seen a whole lot of people. I've even had people say it to me this week that's been to the revival meeting. The thing that I regret the most, that it took me so long to get saved. Right. Or that I got saved, but it took me so long to start growing. You know what they were saying? They were saying, listen, I just lived for my flesh. And now I've come to the end of my life. And I wish so much that I would have hated my life. They didn't say it in those terms. But what they were saying was... I wish that I would have hated my life to the point where I would give it to Christ Amen. Come on. and then Amen. I'd win. Amen. Amen? I would win. And you know, that's what we want for every one of you. Man, listen, we want you to win in life. We want you to be a winner. I was talking to some of my coaches this week uh, for getting ready for football camp and I was explaining my philosophy to some of my, my coaches that are helping me. I said, you know, guys, this is, this is really how I go into it. I, I want these boys to experience winning. I want them to win on their block. I want them to win on the handoff. I want them to win on the pitch out. I want them to win the, the play, win the game. I want them win by making a touchdown. Because I just feel like if we can get these boys, if we can give them a taste of what it means to win, the taste to win, then maybe we can translate it in, in that, son, we want you to win in life. We want you to win in your marriage. We want you to win over temptation. We want you to be a winner. We want you to be a winner. And you know that's what the Lord is saying in this passage. He is saying, I am telling you how to be a winner. And if you want to be a loser, then you just let the flesh, just get, get everything you want. You love this life, and you're going to lose. But if you'll hate your life to the point to where you'll give Christ everything, you're a winner. And that's what we want for every single one of you. We want you to win. Isn't it wonderful to win? Amen. Anybody like board games? Board games, amen. 
I, I, I don't really like them too much because I hate to stand that still. But anyway, uh, but I, I engage in them, and I, my granddaughters, they love to play, and I, I let them beat me. Now, I never let my kids beat me. There ain't no way in this world, amen. But my grandkids, I let them just slaughter me. That's just the way it happens, amen. All right, that's being a part of a grandpa or grandma, amen. But, boy, there's just something about winning. I mean, I'll set it up to where I'm saying, look at the checkerboard, look it up. And I'll set her up with just, at one time, Sophia would just clear the board. Papa, I took, why, well, how in the world did you do that? Huh? <laughs> Woo, I beat Papa, I beat Papa. There's just something about winning. And Jesus says, I want you to win. And this is how you win. Win, amen? Win. When you give it all to Jesus, I'm telling you, you're a winner. That's right. And that's what we want for all of you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Let's buy for prayer, shall we? Did I do it in 20 minutes, Brother Ed? Did I do it? All right. Amen. <laughs> Let's stand together, shall we? Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> he that findeth his life shall lose it, but he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Love and lose or hate and win. Gang, we want you to be winners. Anybody here today say, Preacher, I'm not even a Christian. I've been hearing all this preaching and had all this fellowship and all this testimony testifying, but I find myself not even a Christian outside of Christ, and I, I, need, I need to be saved. Anybody like that, lift your hand up, let us pray for you. Anybody like that? Anybody, if you need to be saved, we want to help you do that. Amen. Anybody like that? All right. Now, I know I, I could ask the question, do you want to win at life? I hope that you do. Amen. I hope that you do. And how Brother Ed laid that out so clear for us today. Good night. And then the Lord led me just to go right on top of it and just really drop the plow just a little bit deeper and move on. Really, what we're saying is just stay in Goshen. Get out of Egypt. I just use the New Testament just to show it. Stay in Goshen. That's where the blessings are. Amen. Stay out of Egypt. Get out of it. Christians, Christians that live their life in Egypt, believers that live their life in Egypt, they lose. But when you get out of that, get to Goshen, that's where the blessings are. And that's what we want for you. I'm going to ask... Uh, this Christian to play an invitation. I got the name right right now, amen. Almost said we're going to have Brother Ed play, but I, I didn't want to do that to you, amen. <laughs> but we're going to have Miss, Miss Christian uh, play uh, the invitation number for us. And Kristen, sorry about that, amen. And listen, won't you come and dedicate yourself to the Lord right now? Maybe you just need to get out of Egypt, head to Goshen. Maybe you need to just say, I, I, I don't want to uh, lose my life. I'm going to hate it for Jesus' sake and get under the spout where the glory comes out. The blessing. The blessing. Love, lose, or hate or gain. That's the word for us today. 